Chapter 9 Now I have two constant companions. Alice has been my little shadow almost since she could walk. Getting my chores done while she helps makes everything twice as hard. But now I also have Samuel. Samuel is recovering well from the stingray attack. He relished eating the odd-looking creature and shared the meat with us as well. But his leg was so torn up from where they pulled out the barb, it is still too painful for him to work in the fields or tend the cattle. Others who have been stung died later of infection or gangrene, so Samuel is sticking close to me and my mother, having us check the wound and treat it with herbs. He hobbles over each morning and plops himself down, ready to talk. On the third day of this, I decide our cottage is too small, too hot and too smoky for all of us, so I bring my work and my entourage outside. My mother leaves to fetch water and to see if there is a ration of eggs for us. I build a fire in our outdoor pit and put our porridge on to cook. I set Alice on the ground with a few kernels of corn and a small mortar and pestle that we normally use for herbs. Then I go to work with the big stone mortar and pestle to grind our corn. Samuel sits on a chair with his leg propped up on a log. He swats at the buzzing flies. I notice that the bandage, which is supposed to cover the back of his calf, is mostly falling off. I figure it is good for the wound to get some air, so I leave it hanging open. Tell me about the prophecy, I say. This is a conversation he always enjoys, talking about the prophecy given to Chief Powhatan by his high priests shortly before the first English ships came to Jamestown. It has been one year since Chief Powhatan died. Some say he died of grief after he learned that his favourite daughter, Pocahontas, had died in England. His brothers, Opichapam and Opichankanu, have taken over his positions as paramount chiefs over all the tribes. Samuel tips his head back, letting the sun shine on his face. He begins to recite the prophecy. In the time of the first planting of corn, there will come a tribe from the Bay of the Chesapeake. That was you, the first ships, I say. You and Captain Smith and my father and all the rest. You landed in April and you were that tribe because you sailed up the Chesapeake Bay. Samuel nods. We have recited this together many times ever since I was small. I fill in the rest of my part. And Chief Powhatan had the Chesapeake tribe all killed or captured because he thought they were the tribe in the prophecy. Samuel continues. This tribe will build their longhouses on the land of the Powhatan. They will hunt and fish and plant on the land of the Powhatan. This was your settlement when you built the first cottages in Jamestown, I say. Then there were the battles. Yes, says Samuel. Three times the Powhatan will rise up against this tribe. The first battle will end and the Powhatan will be victorious. The first battle ended when Captain Smith and Chief Powhatan became countrymen, I say. Then there was peace. Captain Smith is a hero to me and to many. Samuel says he was very brave and fair. Samuel goes on. But the tribe will grow strong again. The Powhatan will rise up. The second battle will end and the Powhatan will be victorious. That battle started when Captain Smith went back to England and the leaders here went on a rampage against the Indians, I say. But it's over now. We're at peace. Samuel swats at a fly. Yes, the peace of Pocahontas. My stomach twists. I hear Samuel's voice in my head speaking to my father two years ago when Pocahontas died. How long do you think the peace will last with her gone? We are still at peace, even with Rebecca gone, I say hopefully. Samuel goes back to reciting. But the tribe will grow strong once more. The third battle will be long and filled with bloodshed. By the end of this battle, the Powhatan kingdom will be no more. We are silent for a time. This last part has always seemed impossible to me. How could the Powhatan Kingdom ever be no more? There are so many more of them than there are of us, thousands more. And this is their land, their country. Chief Powhatan, up until he died last April, said he wanted to live at peace with us. And now the new leaders, his brothers, have vowed to keep that peace. Though each individual tribe and town has its own chief, Chief Opet Chankanu and Chief Opet Chapham rule over all the tribes together. If they want peace, then all of the tribes must listen to them. Do you think the last part is true? I asked Samuel. Maybe the Indian priests made a mistake when they gave the prophecy. He shrugs. Maybe they did. He senses my discomfort. 
and maybe it will be many years from now before it happens. I pound the pestle into the grain, letting the rhythm calm me. I hope we stay at peace for a long time, I say. Forever. We all do, he says. Alice decides she wants to climb into his lap, and he winces, but he lets her. Alice, be careful, I say. No kicking. I don't kick, Samuel, she says solemnly. My mother returns home with the yoke across her shoulders and two full buckets of water hanging from the ends. She is carrying a basket with four eggs in it. I help her unload the water buckets. I don't suppose we'll have to beg you to eat with us, Samuel, Mum says. She sounds a bit annoyed. It's the third day in a row, and Samuel's rations go to him now instead of my father, the way they used to when Samuel still lived with us. Ginny, go to my cot in the barracks and reach under my mattress. You'll find a piece of salt pork wrapped in a rag, Samuel says. I've been keeping it for a special occasion, and that must be today. Under your mattress? Mum asks. I'm surprised the dogs didn't find it. She breezes into the cottage to lay the table. I leave them with Alice still bouncing on Samuel's knee to retrieve the hidden treasure. When I return, my father has already come in from the fields for our midday meal. He picks Alice up and she giggles. I go to check on Samuel's leg to see how the fresh air has been helping it to heal. I take one look and scream. The wound is filled with pale, wriggling maggots. My mother comes running from inside the cottage. By now Alice is crying. My father is laughing. Samuel is staring at his leg as if it might jump up and bite him and I have one hand over my mouth to keep from vomiting. Mum takes Alice to calm her and examines Samuel's very lively wound. Oh, for heaven's sake, come and let's eat, Mum says, trying hard not to join my father in his laughter. Samuel and I both look at her. Eat, I say in a weak voice. Yes, I'll pick them out later, she says. In the meantime, let them do their work. Work? Samuel asks. His face is ashen. He and I have both been reduced to one-word sentences. They will eat out the dead tissue, Mum says. It's the best thing to clean out infection. I'm too hungry to refuse dinner, and so is Samuel. While we eat, I make Samuel keep his leg under the table where I can't see it, and I try not to think about those wriggly, squirmy maggots.